Well, Kevin Duffy, it's a pleasure to have you here from Houston, Texas. From uh, I'm in Dallas now. You're in Dallas now. What happened? I moved to Dallas about a year ago. Okay. You're happy with the move? Yeah, so far. Okay. And your firm moved too, or are you just working remotely? No, we we, uh, we moved the whole firm there. Okay. And for uh, your firm analyzes companies, and run, you run a hedge fund? We run a, right, a hedge fund from a... Uh, a, uh, an Austrian perspective, a global macro long short hedge fund. Yeah. So you're very much in touch with the uh, daily, hourly, minute by minute uh, market happenings. I remember in, when was it, October 2008, we had this wonderful conversation. You were at the airport. Right. Talking on your cell phone. Out of, out of breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was exciting. We were all out of breath in that period because yes. everything was falling apart, or so it seemed. You had a different point of view. You said things were reality was asserting itself. Yeah, the market was starting to assert some discipline on the system. And I think you and I were both kind of excited to see that that cleansing start to take place. Yeah. And uh, you could see it take place with, uh, especially in the private sector, companies uh, that that had uh, expanded. I mean, uh, retail retail uh, square footage was growing at eight to ten percent. Throughout the the two thousands, and uh, and that stopped, and and capital spending got cut, and you could see how companies were just being very conservative, free cash flows going up, and the strong were surviving. The companies like linens and things were were liquidating, and their competitors like Bed Bath and Beyond were were doing well. So that part of the process worked exceptionally well. Uh, within the banking system, though, they. They arrested that with the, with the bailouts. I think we probably d discussed that as well. We did, and uh, I think we did, we talked at the time. There was uh, there was a uh, the prevailing attitude was that the world was falling apart and would completely collapse. The entire world financial system would come tumbling down unless the unless the federal the Federal Reserve intervened and the Treasury intervened. And I recall it was your view at the time that this was just lots lots of hysteria, really. Yeah, and I guess we'll never know because now we we know what what they've accomplished. I mean, they have intervened in in a massive way, um, uh, not just the the bailouts, the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet by two trillion dollars, uh, the the national debt, essentially not allowing uh, the the GSEs to be liquidated. So um, those implied uh, uh, liabilities became explicit to the taxpayer. So. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet increases by $2 trillion. The, the debt, the total debt, if you include the GSEs that got brought on, about $6 trillion. I mean, we've thrown this wild party, so we just, uh, and what have we, what have we accomplished for, for all this? I mean, we, we did, we've gotten the, the biggest rally in the stock market, uh, the biggest two-year rally in something like 64 years. And we've, we've created a lot of the discipline that was being imposed back then um, has been removed. And now we're bringing back the old bad habits that we had during the, the, the bubble, the housing bubble and the credit bubble. Now, near the end of the, of the credit bubble, uh, there weren't too many people warning that it was coming to an end. You were among them, but there yeah. weren't that many. Well, I think within the Austrian community, there were a lot. That we're, we're warning about this. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. I think um, the GSEs. Uh, there was a, an article written. Uh, it was in the Free Market Newsletter. I think back in 2003 by Christopher Mayer oh, yeah. about uh, mortgage market socialism. That was a fascinating article, and and we still have that on our website. And it really laid out the case for for us to short the GSEs. We started our fund in, in the middle of 2002, and we shorted uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that entire time. And it took until 2007 before the wheels started to come off. And then, of course, 2008, the uh, the shareholders were wiped out. Despite all of the QE1, QE2, I mean, all the intervention and everything, uh, there's still downward price pressure on, on real estate markets. Yeah, and this is what's so fascinating is that you, they have thrown the kitchen sink at this. I mean, they've bailed out... The, the crony capitalists, they're still around. They have uh, engorged the government. They've engorged the private sector. They've harmed the uh, the real economy, has suffered through all this. But it's been the political economy that's done well. It's also been, you can see it with, uh, with beef prices versus poultry prices. You know, the average person is suffering. The, the poultry business is not doing well. But beef is doing well, and high-end restaurants are, are doing extremely well. 
Uh, but the, the prices on real estate with a, with a continued uh, downward pressure, uh, every few days it seems like there's more news that, uh, look, we haven't fell on as far. It, it, it seems like a demonstration of the limits of government power. Well, I think it's also it, it's exactly it's it's limits on the on the power. They don't have control, and it's this idea that they're in control of of things. The, you know, they're printing all this money, they're creating all this money, and they're trying to expand credit. They're not able to do that. Right. They're not able to just just siphon money wherever they they want it to. And I think the lesson that's one of the lessons, and another lesson is that the old balloon, the old bubble, once it bursts. That balloon has a hole in it, and it will not take the new money. Right. So look at, I mean, QE2 is a great example. Look at what they've accomplished. And I think it's fascinating. You know, you look at, at the, uh, the recovery in the stock market that we had from March of 2009 through uh, April 15th of, of last year. Mm -hmm. That was QE1. And at the top of that, you had the cover of, of Newsweek about how the uh, the economic recovery is in place. You had Obama, Barack Obama, on the cover of Business Week, and he's shooting a, a free throw, and it's a, a silver dollar. Uh, and the uh, it was all about Obamanomics is working. And then it says, and, and who says so? Wall Street. As if Wall Street were, were any kind of an expert on, on this sort of thing. Right. The same people that got it wrong um, now are saying that, that this is working. And and so that that was right at the top of this this rally in the in the market, and then we get it all starts to um, fall apart into the summer of last year, and then QE two comes along with just you know after throwing th trillions of dollars at the the economy, now it's just a mere six hundred billion dollars, and what what has happened since then, and uh, it's really fascinating because you see. Uh, cotton prices are up 150 percent, and you have sugar prices are up uh, 60 percent, and copper is up 23 percent, and uh, uh, gold is uh, the gold is only up 14 percent. And this is what's kind of interesting that they've done it; they've been able to achieve a couple of things, but none of these things were intended. Right? You so know, they're the trying. Right. They're trying to. What are, what are they trying to do? They're buying the long end of the of the government bond market. So what happens? Long bond yields go up, and in fact, the worst performing asset class since August twenty seventh, when they announced this, is Treasury bonds, down ten percent. Everything else is up. Stocks are up over twenty percent across the board. But then, even within the stock market and within the precious metals market, you're seeing the the animal spirits come back. You're seeing they've they've ignited this inflation. So, for example, um, in 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 the precious metals market, gold is up 14 percent, but silver is up 84 percent. And you're getting the public now is is buying coin sales are off are off the charts. Right, and, and the treasury can't even keep them in stock. Right, and then even within the gold mining stocks, senior gold stocks are up only ten percent. They've actually lagged behind the stock market, whereas junior gold mining stocks are up thirty percent. Mm -hmm. And then you have the stock market, which has been completely insane. Uh, you, you now have Jim Cramer, who's on top of the world. So in, at the bottom of the market, in March of 2009, he's on the Jon Stewart show. And you know, of course, this is the Jim Cramer who, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in August of 2007, was, was telling the Fed that they know absolutely nothing and they need, need to lower rates, which they, of course, did. And it didn't matter. It didn't stop the, the meltdown from, from happening. And uh, this is the same Jim Cramer that said, if you don't buy Lehman, Bear, and, Gold and Goldman here, you're an idiot. And this right. was at the, not at the very top, but close enough to the top. Yeah, close to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a large part of your job, in addition to analyzing the balance sheets of particular companies and knowing where the best places are to put your money, must involve somehow looking at the present state of things and sorting out what represents real recovery. Which you would expect some of that, given the depths to which everything sank, you would expect some some real economic growth. Separating that out from the phony, the artificial, uh, the new bubbles that are being created, how do you do that? 
Yeah, well, um, that's what, you know, it's funny. I have a, a friend who lives in, in Phoenix, and during the, the height, I mean, he, he, had, he was at ground zero of the housing bubble. And in 2005, he used to say every day he would just get up and, and look out the window and wonder what is real. And, and that's kind of where we are today is, is just start to try to sort through what, what is real. So we just stick, stick to uh, very defensive areas, you know, basic necessities, um, and try, try to avoid the, the cyclical companies. But uh, we also do it on a, on a valuation basis because you can see that when you get these bubbles, you get this, um, this vacuum effect. So you have this money is pouring into speculative names like the sales, salesforce.com and Netflix and Lululemon and things like that. Well, at the same time that's happening, there are broad pools of where money is, is taken out of. And this is exactly what happened during the tech bubble. You had during the tech bubble, the six months leading up to the, the bubble in March of 2000, uh, 2000 you had stocks like um, Procter & Gamble and Abercrombie and & Fitch uh, down 40, 50%. Yeah. Uh, and it was the old economy value stocks that people were were selling so that they could basically buy more lottery tickets. Yeah, pets.com and, and the right, like. Right, right. And, and this is what's happening today is you have the yeah. same thing where uh, people are selling Kroger or they're selling, um, uh, we mentioned chicken before, which is yeah. depressed, and, and they're also getting hit by, by high grain costs. Right. So uh, a company like Sanderson Farms. Um, it has just been. But, but isn't isn't this partially just a result of people taking on more risks than the market would otherwise encourage? I mean, you've got enormous moral hazard built into everything. It seems like today. Oh, absolutely. And th this is. I mean, you look at what the damage that the Fed has done. I mean, they have really uh, set off this speculative fuse, and it's in lowering interest rates. You can see the whole risk profile change. And it's amazing when, you know, you think about the, the, the conversation that we had in October of 2008 and people panicking and the risk profile, how it, how it got brought down, and today, how it has completely changed it's a, as if nothing, is, nothing has changed whatsoever. They've, um, the, the, the discipline that was being imposed is gone. And the speculators are back. It's just like 2007 yeah. again. And it's very difficult to assess uh, this going forward. Uh, something like a, a moral hazard is just doesn't lend itself to any kind of serious m measurement or evaluation. You just have to kind of watch it play itself out. Yeah. Well, we. I mean, we can quantify some of these things, and we can see. I mean, one of the other things I wanted to add was um, that uh, in terms of uh, that when the Fed lowers rates, it's um, there's a saying in the business: there's more money lost chasing yield than at the point of a gun. Uh -huh. People, people have been crawling out on the risk limb because of lower rates, and then then they see. Uh, in the beginning, they're they're very cautious, but then they see the market start to move up, and we get further and further that the, you know all of what happened in 2008 slips into the memory hole. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've had uh, 600, you've you've had a huge drop in money market fund balances. And like I said, you can quantify this. You can see that um, it take money market fund balances as a percentage of mutual fund plus exchange traded fund assets. At the top of every bubble, the technology bubble, the credit bubble, and this stimulus bubble, it's about 20%. And at the bottom, we had, I think we got up to 35% at the bottom in, in uh, 38% yeah. in, uh, in 2008, 2009. But it puts Austrians in a strange situation. I think we talked about this in 2008. At, at the time, your worry was not the recession or the deleveraging. That was not the thing that was, that was causing the worry. You, you were worried even then about the recovery. Yeah, we were exactly. We were worried about the the inter, that that they would intervene right. and not allow this process, this healthy cleansing process, to take because place. As this, as this continues, then uh, you, then uh, people become ever more risk averse, and uh, or or I should say they're adopting more and more risk investments, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we've got inflationary pressure now, and really uh, we seem to be not on the road to uh, renewed prosperity, but just a, a replay. Uh, well, and it's not just what's going on in this country, but it, it's what's going on around the world as yeah. well. I mean, they haven't. It's not like we're in isolation. Right. You know, you have these problems 
I think China is a is a great example of what's going on. Are you of the the view that that we have a a, a bubble in China? Yeah, I I think you know the the Austrian insight. I was listening to Joe Salerno the other day, and he talked about uh, when you you get this artificial boom, you see it's uh, overconsumption plus malinvestment as a result of excessive credit expansion. Right. And doesn't that sum up what's going on in in China? Right. Uh, you know, you've got uh, in 2009, uh, credit expanded uh, by 100 percent. You've had and money supply grew by 30 percent, and mm -hmm. now it's growing at about 20 percent. Right. Um, just you know, huge. You talk about the stimulus. A lot of this has been coming from China, and it's a little bit frustrating because I know there are, are people that consider themselves uh, anti. Fed, anti-Bernanke, you know, pro-Austrian that I think have been sort of co-opted by this idea that that China is, is a positive influence and, right. and that that's going to just take commodity prices up and gold up and all the rest of it. Well, you know, have, you have you know, wild speculation in, in China. You've got, um, I remember the Japan bubble in the late 1980s. Yes. You had uh, housewives selling mutual funds door to door, China. and you had million dollar golf club memberships right. and, and just insane valuations of, of property. Well, you've got this, a similar thing going on in, in China right now. Yeah. You know, you've got um, in Beijing, uh, land prices are up nine times in 10 years. And they've got, it's the same kind of inflation. The inflation statistics are, are way understated there. And, uh, and people are trying to keep up with the inflation. And so they're, they're speculating. Now, in addition to following the markets as closely as you do, you also spend a great deal of time uh, looking at fundamentals that you read in the Austrian books. That's why you're here at the Scholars Conference, which is, which is wonderful because you're a kind of a, a practitioner of the Aust of, uh, of Austrian economics, but but you don't neglect the theory. You're thinking about the theory all the time. H how does that work in your own mind? Well, um, I think a, a couple of things. One, there, there's so much that that applies, but in 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 our business, um, uh, Nassim Taleb talk, talks about this: the uh, being fooled by random randomness, and it's the it's the survival of the not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the least fit. And what we've had here is this last 20 years, kind of this artificial uh, period in in the markets, and the survivors and those that have, have uh, been the most successful have been interventionists. They've been Keynesians in various strains of intervention. And, um, and I think this is, this is where we have a, a, a big advantage, just viewing the world through this Austrian non-interventionist lens. And so, you know, our competitors right now are basically, the, what's the justification for being in the stock market? Well, either the intervention is going to work and we'll get a recovery, or it won't work and the Fed will just print more money. Right. And that's the extent of the analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think it gives us a, a huge advantage. Do you encourage your, your clients to, to read uh, in the Austrian tradition? Well, uh, fortunately, we don't have to because a lot of our we've we what we know from this business is that uh, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Tony Deaton. Uh, who's a big supporter of the Institute and has been over a long period of time, he always says that, that the problem with this business is when you run it like a business. And I think what he meant is this isn't the kind of business that you can um, maximize revenues in, in the short run. You really have to think about the long run. And the problem is that, that the customer really doesn't know what, what's best for them. And so you need, you can't just have people chasing a track record, chasing short-term performance. You really need to have a philosophical fit. So we have most of our clients, we are, you know, they're very patient. And what, what gives them that, because we go through ups and downs, is that they, they tend to be Austrians, they tend to be libertarians, and, and they, they definitely, either they're, they're in that camp or we're, they're, or they're close, you know, and we're trying to move them uh, toward in that direction as much as possible. Yeah. Well, I hope that we can meet back again uh, maybe next year or maybe in, I don't want to wait two and a half years to see how all this is going to play out. But uh, these are very exciting times, very different times than they were in, in 2008. Um, um, and it will be interesting to watch, see what happens, and to hear your views as we go along. So I'd like to thank you for coming today. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.